Then we'll move on to our three, obviously, abnormal academics um, <laughs> to talk um, about their own um, tips and hints and twists and turns. Um, and then we'll have our question session. So over, back over to you, Nicole. OK, back to me. Um, all right, a little bit about me. Um, I mean, as Leslie said, I'm not an academic. I've had quite a different to, career path to, to people on this stage, but a little bit about that. Um, so I studied law um, and I was a lawyer for the first part of my career. I worked as a, a lawyer in private practice. Um, and at that point in my life, my career goals were very, very clear. Um, I was an employment lawyer, so I did work across primarily employment and industrial law. I worked in quite a competitive um, law firm environment. It was a very hierarchical and, and set career path. Um, you started out normally as a paralegal while you were studying law. You then became a lawyer when you, when you um, passed your degree. And then you worked up to senior associate and if you were lucky, partner. My career goal was very clear at that point in my life. I wanted to make partner and I wanted to do it before I had babies. Um, they were my, my key goals because I thought if I can go as hard and fast as I can now, I can have my children and that will put me in a much safer position when I am a partner. And that worked out pretty well for me. Um, so I was able to be promoted fairly quickly. Um, I was the youngest person to be promoted to senior associate in my firm um, and I was offered partnership at the age of 27. At that point in time, I had a bit of a realisation that I didn't actually want to be a partner of a law firm. <laughs> um, and that was probably one of the first learnings in my career, that you kind of get on a pathway and you're so focused. And then I got there and I thought, yeah, this is great, I can become a partner before I have my babies, but then what am I going to do? Because I actually have no idea how I would be a partner and have any work-life balance. And so, um, having been offered partnership in the law firm where I worked for all of my legal career, um, I turned them down. And they didn't take that particularly well, I've got to say. <laughs> Um, so what happened was, after that happened, I, I decided that I was going to leave. A colleague of mine had set up a consulting practice and she was very keen for me to come and work with her, uh, but I had a restraint. So it's fairly common in, in legal and professional services that if you leave a place, um, you can't work in competition for a year. And the firm that I worked for made it very clear that they were intending to enforce that restraint with the full force of the law. And so what did I do? Um, I took on an in-house job at a university called the University of New South Wales. And I intended to be there for the duration of my restraint. I thought this will be interesting, an in-house job, um, it'll be worthwhile sort of finding a little bit about universities, but I had no idea how much I would enjoy working in a university environment. Um, and within my sort of first three to six months, I actually thought, you know what? This is a place that I'd really like to stay. Um, and I guess the, the first sort of element of my, um, of my career story is you don't always know where things are going to end up. Um, for me, I would have been much happier had I been not had, had my restraint enforced and allowed to go and work at, um, with my colleague in, in a legal consultancy. But actually, had that happened, I never would have had the career that I had. Um, I can tell you I never planned to work in human resources. Um, I had quite a dim view of the, of the human resources profession um, when, I was, when I was young, I had very bad experiences with HR people. Um, the first person I came across who hired me into that law firm told me at my probationary period that he was very pleased that I had worked out well because he only hired me because he thought I was good looking um, and then proceeded to crack on to me for the majority of my time there. So I had a very dim view of the HR profession, never thought that I would um, go into that. And when I started to work at um, UNSW, I was still very much in a legal role um, and worked very closely with the HR profession. And I got to a point in my career where I really had to decide, I had a real sort of fork in the road. Um, I knew that I wanted to progress and I needed to decide, did I want to generalise my legal practice and move more into a general counsel type role or did I want to actually take the, the plunge and move more into an HR role? That was a really difficult decision for me because being a lawyer was very much part of my identity. It was who I was, I loved it, I loved the law, I enjoyed my job every day, all day, every day. Um, but there were some real restrictions around how that would have panned out as a, a career for me. And ultimately it came down to something very simple. I made a decision about where do I feel more at home? Do I feel more at home in the legal office or do I feel more at home with my HR colleagues? 
Um, and for me, I liked HR people at that point in time more than I liked lawyers. Um, and that was how I made the decision. So um, I then had a very great opportunity. I, I had my first child. Um, they, they recruited somebody to work on a temporary basis while I was on maternity leave in my legal role. And when I came back, one of my colleagues who was in a senior leadership role in HR, um, her husband had gone to work overseas um, and her job was unfilled. And the HR director said to me, Nicole, would you be interested in, in doing this HR leadership role? Um, and I, I was interested in doing it. For me, the, the biggest attraction was managing people. I had never managed a big group of people. I've managed projects and small legal teams, but this was a group of 40 people. And so coming back from maternity leave, I thought, look, I'm gonna give this a go. And I managed a, a group there of about half of the HR department at UNSW. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I found that I really enjoyed managing people. Um, I actually found how I spent my days were not dissimilar. Um, and that was really how I transitioned into an HR career and then came from, from UNSW here to Macquarie. And I guess the final thing that I would say in closing is, often people say to me, Nicole, how did you manage that transition? You know, how do you find being an HR person compared to being a lawyer? And the answer is, it's actually incredibly similar. I find how I spend my days, the skills that I use, um, the sorts of issues that I'm dealing with, remarkably similar. Um, and the reflection for me is, often actually it's less about your job title or about the technical skills that you have. Um, the skills that I rely upon every day, which were the same whether in law or whether in HR, are things like the ability to relate to people, um, the ability to listen, the ability to problem solve. Um, those are the sorts of skills that I use, have used across all of my jobs. And I actually don't remember a lot about what I learned in law school. There's a few reasons for that, but I don't remember a lot about what I learned in law school. Um, but what I think it, it taught me how to do was it taught me how to think, how to problem solve, and how to connect with people. And they are the very same skills that I use in, in this job. Um, so I guess my sort of reflections are, some of these things are, are not always according to plan. Um, and you know, rolling with those things and taking some risks, I think is a really good thing. And you'd be surprised how, how able you would be to move between different professions and how similar the skill sets are that you use in different jobs. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Thanks, Nicole. Sure. So, um, unlike Nicole, who clearly had quite a driven career path from the beginning, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> um, but seriously, I, I never really um, had any aspirations to a career. Um, and my story has been one of um, accidents um, and in some ways there's a, there's a favourite book from, from my, uh, my teenage years, a book called uh, Trickmaster Monkey by Maxine Hong Kingston and the hero of that tale um, asks his mentor, how do you get a life? And the answer is, say yes more often. Um, and I think that sums up what I have kind of done uh, in my working life. So um, as Leslie said, I started out uh, doing an undergraduate degree. Um, the BSc was not the first degree I began. Um, I actually began in mechanical engineering, believe it or not. Um, and I like to say that at, uh, at the end of second year, they took us to a nail factory and they showed us uh, these engineers standing at drawing boards, because it was a long time ago, drawing nails. Um, and they said, this is your future. <laughs> I said, no, it's not. <laughs> but uh, I think the real, the real story is that um, I couldn't handle fluid dynamics, but hey, that's, that's kind of by the by. So I ended up graduating with a BSc and majoring in design. But my undergraduate experience was really about student politics. So I was uh, the editor of the student newspaper at that institution which Nicole mentioned, um, and involved in, in student politics uh, as part of my, my undergraduate career. And I, I really think that most of my undergraduate learning was around there. I'd love to be able to say that uh, the student politicians that I hung out with ended up ruling the country, but it wasn't actually that cohort. I think uh, the most high profile uh, colleague at the time was Andrew the Bishop, who now runs the world through the entertainment desk of Channel 10. Um, but absolutely, there was a lot of learning that happened through student politics that certainly shaped a lot of thinking um, and continues to shape a lot of, a lot of my thinking. Um, but again, there was a little twist. So when I was running the student newspaper, um, it was about the time when uh, the traditional newspaper industry was and, and publishing industry was going through a significant disruption. So we were actually the first newspaper, or one of the first newspapers in the country 
which shifted from the old galleys of type, bromide machines, waxing, I know you're probably all too young to remember this, but you used to have to lay out a newspaper with scissors and, and, and hand. And we moved to a computer-based design approach, and we were literally one of the first newspapers in the country to do that. Um, and one of my colleagues at the time and I were sitting around and towards the end of our tenure saying, you know what, I think there's a business in this. So we started a business um, doing computer-based design and publishing. Uh, and one of the first things that, uh, that happened in that business was I realised I had no idea how to run a business. Um, and there was like, okay, so we need to get money. How does that happen? You need clients. So what do you do? You pick up the phone. And so basically the first couple of months of, of the business was me on the phone going through the phone book calling people saying, hi, we've got a business. We do this. Would you like our services? Um, and massive cold calling. Uh, and the rule of thumb was uh, one in every six people would answer, uh, one in every six of those would be interested in having a chat, one in every six of those would have a meeting, and one in every six of those would actually end up being a client. So there was a huge amount of work. And I guess that really instilled in me a sense that, you know, don't take anything for granted. You actually have to work for this stuff, you know? Uh, and, and as an aside, when I got to university, I was staggered the students just came. It's like, really? They just come? <laughs> you, don't, you don't actually have to go out and get them? So that was, that was kind of a strange thing to me. Um, and that business morphed into a multimedia design production company, and we were doing all sorts of interesting things. Uh, again, most of you are probably too young to remember the golden age of CD-ROM. Um, that was my fault. Um, and we did a whole lot of interesting things with publishing companies, corporates, etc. Uh, and one of, the, one of the projects that we did on the side was uh, uh, a few of us thought, well, there's this whole thing called real estate classifiers that, you know, that could do with reinvention. You know, it's all this, still in newspapers, it's kind of old fashions. This was mid-90s. And so we, uh, we thought, well, let's, let's make this electronic. And we looked at the then fairly nascent internet and said, okay, well, that's not gonna work, it's all too slow. You know, everyone had 28K modems, it was really slow. We wanted this wonderful multimedia experience. So, so we persuaded the Bulletin magazine to put on the back of its issues a CD-ROM full of commercial real estate. Um, the company that, that we established did that was a company called RealView. Uh, you probably realise that RealView and the Bulletin no longer exist anymore, which says something about that particular idea. Uh, and the competitor at the time was this little company that decided to go on this little thing called the internet rather than CD-ROM, and they were a little company called realestate.com.au. So I guess that little story is that sometimes you try things and they don't quite work. You make the wrong bet, and that's fine. You know, there's, there's a, a lot of lessons to be learned from, from the trying and failing. And you're probably wondering, well, what's that got to do with an academic career? So I basically um, got to a point where I got bored. Um, and I remember quite clearly, I was sitting in a meeting um, with the Wilderness Society, actually, and it was, it was a pro bono piece of work that we were doing, um, producing some collateral for the Wilderness Society. And I was really interested in the policy and like, you know, well, what are you going to do about this stuff? And they just looked at me and said, no, no, you're the production guy. Not interested in your views about the other stuff. And I thought, no, I've got a brain that wants to do other stuff. I am actually interested in theory and politics and policy, and I need to find a way to actually engage that part of my brain. And so, sorry Nicole, I thought about becoming a lawyer um, and then decided uh, my better judgment reigned and I chose not to. Um, and so instead I, I stumbled across, there was actually an ad in the newspaper for a, a degree at Macquarie University in media technology and law, which uh, we don't offer anymore, but uh, back in the late 90s we did. And so I, I did an MA in media technology and law uh, towards the end of that, um, the supervisor of my, my master's thesis said, oh, there's a, there's a PhD scholarship going up at UQ uh, looking at internet content regulation. I reckon, reckon that would be something you'd be interested in. So I applied for that um, and I got it. Um, and I spoke to my UQ supervisor and, and he said, uh, so when are you moving up? And I said, I'm not. I said, you know, I, I own property in Sydney, I'm not moving. Um, and so I did my, my degree. I, I think I went up there once or twice a year. Um, we did it through email and phone calls and chats and it was all, all good. 
uh, I was about halfway through the PhD, um, doing what PhD students do. I was, I was tutoring at UWS at the time, UNSW, a little bit of work here um, as a sessional academic. Um, and a job came up here in the media department, so I threw my hat in the ring um, and got it. And so that's 2001, that's how I started here at Macquarie. Um, and then basically I'd like to say that I got to where I am now because of my children. Um, and this is a little bit uh, glib, perhaps, but uh, when I first got offered the job at Macquarie, I was actually moving house, driving the removal van when the phone call came in. My partner was eight months pregnant, um, and we got offered, I got offered a job here at Macquarie, so I said yes, of course, because that's what I do, I say yes. Um, and so I got the job here at Macquarie, um, and two months later, my first daughter was born. Uh, there, we just moved into a house in the east. No childcare in the east, so childcare here at uh, Macquarie on campus, which was fantastic. Except speaking as a fairly junior academic, the only problem with getting childcare on campus is that you have to go to work to get childcare. So um, I actually found myself in the office when there was no one else in the office. Um, because I came out here for the childcare. Uh, and what happens when you're in the office is that people who are looking for people to be on committees or to do work see you in the office. What's that saying? Life happens to those who show up. Um, so suddenly I was the chair of this committee and the chair of that committee and people were saying, well, why don't you do this and why don't you do that? And, you know, be, me being me said, yeah, sure, why not? Um, and so my, my trajectory in some ways is one of those happy accidents of, of me saying yes. Uh, and that's how I am where I am. Thank you, Shannon. Mariella. All right. So, um, first of all, um, I'd like to um, reassure you that when a panel member like this is being introduced and, and, and Leslie says, oh, they've done this and this and this and this, and it looks really very linear, and it gives you the impression that back when we were undergraduates or interns or whatever, we had this clear vision, you know, as a, as a student, I want to be the chair of academic senate. <laughs> and, and so I've you know, put, put all my energy to get there. That, that's really a, a, a not quite so. Um, in fact, uh, the vision is very short. It really, in my case anyway, it was really just sort of the next opportunity. And it, and it only looks linear looking backwards. Looking forwards is a bit foggy and you just maybe see the next step ahead of you. So ju just keep that in mind whenever you're, even at a conference and you have a, a plenary speaker and you go, wow, you know, they had this big vision of going somewhere. They probably didn't. They just had opportunities that came along. So if I, if I have to um, um, describe um, my, my path, I'd, I'd have to put it down to sort of three epiphanies uh, that I had throughout. The first one was when I was a third year student in ecology and I had to select a research project and um, and they gave us some options of what sort of research project, ecological research project and then write a report we could choose from and there was an option for a spider project. There was also an option for a Slater project. Slater's a little land crustaceans, they roll up Anyway, I chose the spider project and I realized through the project I really love research. And that made my next decisions, you know, it was clear to me that I wanted to do honors and then a PhD and, and whatever follows after that, I had no idea, you know. Very foggy, but just the next step. Um, and this is, you know, I was in a session yesterday that mentioned that Gwyneth Paltrow movie Sliding Doors, you know, she gets on the earlier train, the later train. I think my spider slater situation is that. I'm sort of the Gwyneth Paltrow of um, <laughs> research. Because I think if I had chosen the slater project, I'd be sitting here as a slater um, expert, perhaps. Anyway, this spider project put me on the path with spiders and I've never stopped doing research. But anyway, I realized research is it. And so I poured a lot of energy and patience, a lot of patience, maybe not so much talent, but a lot of patience into making that research happen. And it took waiting a lot for fellowships to come through, spending a lot of time after my PhD to convert my research into papers. And I was very, very patient, but eventually I got my fellowship. 
uh, which took me to Melbourne and I worked for about four years as a postdoc and then you know, I was kind of getting itchy, do something else. Always felt a little bit left out. The department as a postdoc, not quite a real department member. And so this lectureship came up at this university, Macquarie, never heard of it. Um, <laughs> and I went, all right, give it a go. And I, I, um, I went for the, for the lectureship. I, I was offered the job and I started here. And you know, I started teaching. And this is my second epiphany where I went, oh, I really like teaching. So I just, I didn't give up on the research, but I really embraced teaching. I never felt it was an impingement at all or an imposition. I just want to do a really excellent job in inspiring our students uh, for biology. And currently I, I contribute to first year biology, which I very much enjoy. So again, a lot of my energy and my focus goes into making teaching a real success for me. And then, um, as I became a member of the department, and it was, it's a lovely collegiate department, I realized, this is my third epiphany, that I can actually make contributions that change people's life, uh, that make it better. Uh, these contributions could be as, as banal as uh, running Eurovision morning teas, or as, as effective as restructuring an honors program so that, that the, the, the student load and the, the staff workload is, is better manageable. Um, and so, as I'm sitting here, I realize I'm actually maybe normal because <laughs> I actually do all right in research and in teaching and in service. I really enjoy all three of them and you know, I'm as surprised as you are about actually realizing to be the standard of it. <laughs> and that's it. Nick. Oh, thanks. Um, well, I made the mistake by opting to go last on the panel, which means that almost all the things I wanted to say have been said. Um, and and my, um, my experience really does resonate a lot with what uh, my colleagues have said, and certainly the role of accident. Um, my version of the Spider Slater story was that as an undergrad, I was passionate about English, and I was passionate about history as well. And um, I didn't realize that it would come to a point where I would have to choose between those two <coughs> subjects. And, and the, the way I chose was that at enrollment one year, um, I had an option of an English class that was on a Thursday and a history class that was on a Friday, and, and I didn't want to come in on Friday. Um, <laughs> so here I am, I had a career as an English academic. Um, and in retrospect, uh, and I think, uh, you know, I agree with my colleagues. In, in retrospect, if I look at my career, it does look like an absolutely conventional uh, single-track academic career. So I did honours, a PhD, postdoc overseas, and then uh, I've more or less been an academic ever since. And, um, and of course, as my colleagues have said, that disguises a whole series of accidents. And some of those accidents were in just getting the positions originally, and I certainly remember very intensely the emotional um, experience of not having a job, say. So at the end of my postdoc in the US, I remember some moments of kind of absolute crisis that uh, not only did I not have a job to go back to when my postdoc ran out, but, I, but jobs in my area simply weren't being advertised. So there was a feel, and hadn't been for 12 months or longer, and so there was a feeling that, that there were um, you know, limited opportunities, um, and I'd have to start thinking about alternative paths. And of course, I'd been thinking about alternative paths when I finished my undergrad degree, when I finished my honours degree, when I finished my PhD, and now I was doing it again with my postdoc. And I probably thought I was going to go back to being a high school teacher, which is what I was trained to do, or I was going to go and teach English in Japan, or I was going to get a job, um, you know, as a sales rep for a publishing firm. So the, the path that I thought I was on um, was very different. The trajectory that I thought I was moving on was very different to the one that actually materialized. And that's not only true uh, in making a transition into an academic career, it's, it's really true throughout an academic career that, that um, a lot of change will happen in your own level of interest, um, for example. And I'll talk about an instance of 
that in a minute. But more importantly, a lot is going to happen in your academic environment. And I've been through several restructures, um, several departmental splits, um, some formal and cataclysmic, and some just more informal and um, you know, resulting in tension in departments. And they've had huge impacts on the alliances that I've made, research projects that I've gone on to, teaching um, um, themes that I've taken up. And, um, and certainly I ended up in a very different situation, not institutionally, but intellectually, um, than I would have expected. So where I am now and the things that I work on now are very different to what I would have thought I was going to do, even when I started out my academic career. And, and often we think about, um, we think about a, an interrupted or kind of haphazard trajectory in a negative way. And, we have an ideal image in our minds that in any career, um, what, what you want is a really straight path, and when you have to negotiate with things that challenge that or take you off that path or point you in a different direction, that's somehow a negative. And I think just listening to my colleagues um, with really varied experience, that's simply not the case. That, that um, it, they're really, you know, you go through a departmental split, it's intense, it's, it, it involves a lot of conflict, it's very confronting, but at the same time it can be hugely beneficial. It, it, it puts you, um, for example, I, uh, the departmental split I was in, I became an ally with Anne Honey Francis, who's now at UTS, um, and started working and teaching with her. She was more senior and experienced academic than me, and I suddenly learned a lot about uh, working in an area that was unfamiliar to me, but was but became hugely exciting. and. And that, that um, kind of experience, which had seemed so negative, actually turned out to be hugely beneficial um, for me. Similar things have happened later in my career, um, moving from being a, a regular uh, learning and teaching academic into full-time administration. I suppose that's been my whole life, um, and my whole career avoiding administration. And, um, and I became a head of department in one of those classic moments where they asked for volunteers to step forward and everybody else took a step back. And I was, you know, I became the head of department. And, and, and to my great surprise, I, I really loved it. I loved engaging across the university. I loved dealing with strategy and policy. I loved sol trying to solve people's problems. That, that brought my career to, uh, to life in a way that being a regular learning and teaching academic had been become fairly routine to me. And so. Um, a lot of those things that seemed so challenging and seemed so negative actually turned out to be hugely beneficial and the result is that I've now moved into a full-time administrative career, which sounds really dry and boring, but is, it deals very strongly with people, solving people's problems, dealing with, with um, making decisions no one else wants to make, um, and, being, and, and meeting people from different parts of the university that are really, really exciting. Um, so I suppose, um, I mean, my, my um, message would be um, it's really important to move out of your comfort zone. Um, it's easy to stay in your comfort zone, probably less easy now than it was um, you know, when I started out as an academic. Um, but at the same time, um, you should look to do things that you don't want to do. Um, some of the committee work, um, um, engaging with industry, for example, um, uh, getting on research projects, talking to people from different backgrounds, dealing with difficult people, uh, confronting problems that students have, and so on. All things that you don't necessarily want to do, 